Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2010 Nye Lecture, sponsored by the AGU Cryosphere Focus Group. My name, for those of you who don't know me, is Ann Nolan. I'm the new chair of this focus group. And before our Nye Lecture, we are going to re re recognize this year's 2010 recipient of the Cryosphere Young Investigator Award, Dr. Hans-Peter Marshall, which will now be um, presented by Matthew Sturm. Thanks, Ann. Um, it's great to see everybody here so that we can honor HP. Um, and it's a particular honor for me to introduce him. Um, Hans Peter Marshall, who those are whose friends know him as HP, um, is this year's uh, 2010 Cryospheric Young Investigators Award, awardee. I first met HP, I just learned, I was trying to remember the year. I think it was 1996, and he was an undergraduate at the University of Washington. And even then, he just told me he was working on a little gadget, which for those of you who work with HP know, that's really been the history of his career. And, and I, I asked him what was the gadget about, and it was, of course, to look at penetration strength in snow. Um, we, we probably should have known then that he would end here tonight. HP is currently an assistant professor at Boise State University, and his research throughout, since I've known him now, 15 years has focused on snow and the ramifications for snow and in particular um, ways of dealing with snow that are more efficient and better and move the science ahead. Um, first and almost above all else, HP is very curious. If you're around him, he's got great ideas, he's curious about how things work and as soon as he sees how they work now, he thinks about ways to make it better. Um, it's from radar to micropenetrometry to actually papers on ptarmigan browsing in snow. He's done it all. He's been tr tr tremendously productive for somebody so young. Um, he, the other thing is he's not discouraged very easily. A lot of times when you're developing new technology and equipment, it's pretty easy to get discouraged. Um, and that happens to the best of us, but I've noticed with HP, he just barrels along. Um, He's, the development of new tools, the development of new ideas, there's a whole list of things that he's been developing in a very short career that make him extremely qualified to be this year's young investigator. So it's with great pleasure I'd like to present him as this year's awardee. Thank you to the Cryosphere Focus Group for this award and to NSIDC for the generous travel stipend. I'm very honored. I'd like to thank in particular Martin Schneebly, at my advisor, as well as a visiting graduate student at SLF for the nomination. And thanks also to Matthew Sturm, Kelly Elder, and John Bradford for their generous supporting letters. There's a saying that, that goes, it takes a whole community to raise a child. And the Cryosphere community has certainly done this for me, as there have been so many great people who have uh, had a big, big impact on my career. As an undergrad at UW, I was first exposed to glaciology with the NASA Space Grant Undergraduate Research Program and worked with Twit Conway and Ed Waddington studying avalanches and glaciers. This experience had a huge impact, and I noticed that four out of five of the recipients of this award also did research as undergrads, so please continue to involve young students in your work. I would not be where I am today without the amazing research opportunities that I had at Krell with Gary Coe, Matthew Sturm, Jerry Johnson, and John Holmgren. Thanks also to my PhD advisor, Tad Pfeffer, Joel Harper, um, Chris Peelmeyer, Carl Berklin, Simon Way, Don Klein, Danny Marks, Rick Forrester, Balaji, Kenny Matsuoka, Mark Williams, M Mickey Lenning, Jim McNamara, and the BSU Geosciences Department. I'd like to also thank my own generation of cryospheric scientists, any of whom would be equally deserving of this award, and who have been my friends as well as my colleagues on this path. Shad O'Neill, Nick Rudder, Jeff Deems, Eric Lutz, Tom Newman, Bob Hawley, Ken Tape, Andy Gleason, Marco Tedesco, Brian Lazar, James McCright, Tim Crone, Jeff Johnson, Eli Deeb, and many others. Finally, I'd just like to thank my parents for teaching me to never stop learning, and my wife, Christina, for her unconditional support. The Chrysler community has shaped my career, and I'm honored to be a part of such a great group of scientists. Thank you. Thank you. In, 
in this keynote session, we recognize the outstanding and dynamic science accomplishments of Dr. Jeff Dozier with the Nye Lecture. This keynote lecture is named after John F. Nye, a pioneer in glacier science, who is currently Professor Emeritus in Physics at the University of Bristol. John Nye's paradigm-changing work in ice rheology theory allowed us to predict glacier behavior, including surging glaciers. As land ice responds to climate warming, John Nye's work in ice mechanics and glacier bed dynamics is relevant today as it was when he first developed his theories 50 years ago. Like John Nye, Jeff Dozier is a leader in cryospheric science, whose contributions in three areas have strongly influenced the field for over 30 years. First, he's defined the field for satellite remote sensing of snow. Second, he's applied these advances in remote sensing to improve our understanding of snow hydrology. And third, Jeff has been a visionary leader in earth science planning and infrastructure development, particularly in the area of informatics. His lifelong love of mountains inspired his career as a snow scientist. In his earlier years as a mountaineer and rock climber, Jeff helped lead six expeditions to the Hindu Kush range in Afghanistan, adding multiple first ascents to his record. He spent many years climbing in the California Sierra Nevada and has a dome in Tuolumne Meadows named after him. Jeff received his PhD from the University of Michigan in 1973, and he's been a faculty member at UC Santa Barbara since 1974. He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for Advancement of Science. He's also an honorary professor of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, a recipient of the NASA Public Service Medal, the PCORA Award, and Microsoft's Jim Gray Award for his achievements in data intensive science. Jeff served as senior project scientist for NASA's Earth Observing System, helping build the foundation for NASA's most ambitious and successful Earth remote sensing program. Jeff is an inspiring educator and has played a key role in interdisciplinary education, serving as the founding dean of the UC Santa Barbara Bren School for Environmental Science and Management. Jeff is deeply admired by his students, current and former, for his insightful teaching in the classroom and exciting learning experiences in the mountains. And in recent years, Jeff's role as an educator has further expanded as he has now become a certified telemark instructor. His boundless energy and creative intellect are matched only by his love of mountains and snow. Please welcome Dr. Jeff Dozier. Well, thank you, Anne, for a very kind introduction. I, I thought I should start by explaining my title. And because everybody has asked me about it. Uh, my son asked me when he was sitting next to me as I was preparing the talk, he said, well, what is there to say about the color of snow? Uh, and I'll try to explain that. And then also the fourth paradigm that I'm not uh, sure many of you are familiar with. So the fourth paradigm is a book that came out a year ago, published by Microsoft Research. And it was dedicated to Jim Gray. Uh, Jim was a very well-known uh, database scientist. Uh, he, he influenced all of your lives because he was the one who figured out how to uh, couch database transactions in a way that ATM withdrawals were possible and safe. So you all owe him a debt of gratitude for that. Uh, and he was a member of both the National Academy of uh, Engineering and of Science. And four years ago next month, uh, Jim was lost at sea while he was sailing off the coast here. And he, um, but three weeks before he was lost, he gave a lecture at the National Academy on what he called the fourth paradigm of science, which was very uh, data intensive science discovery. And the fourth paradigm uh, is listed, or the four paradigms are listed here. That is, thousands of years ago, science was experimental and observational. And then um, a few hundred years ago, we studied the heroes that we know about, Newton and Maxwell and folks like that in our uh, entry level science courses. And then in the 60s, really, there came an era of computational science. And that was what Ken Wilson called the third paradigm. And what Jim proposed was that today, science, there, there's a new 
way of doing science that builds on these others that is very data intensive, that integrates models and data, uh, has uh, data mining through very large volumes of data to discover uh, new things. And in addition to this uh, fourth paradigm, there's an emerging science of environmental applications. Uh, my family always asks me uh, you know, why what I do is useful, and I have to explain that. Uh, and, and so the idea is that we're trying to do science that helps people make better decisions. Okay, so that explains, I think, what the fourth paradigm is, and I'll come back to some of that later. Uh, mountain hydrology, I think that is something most of you know something about. Uh, and that is what characterizes the mountain environment is that in many areas, the hydrologic cycle is dominated by snow. <clears throat> the snow comes early in the season, typically during the winter, and then the melt occurs uh, at a time when the water demand has risen. And you know, in various parts of the western United States, uh, most of the majority of water, in fact, comes from melting snow. And worldwide, about a billion people depend on water from melting snow and ice for their water resources. So we can look at what these data look like. This is uh, data from a snow pillow uh, at Levitt Lake uh, in the Sierra Nevada. It gets a lot of snow. Notice that the vertical axis uh, has a snow water equivalent of over two and a half meters. And then I'll be too loud, right? No, no, no. 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 Okay. Okay, there we go. Is that so, and, and what you see on the right-hand side of this slide, based on the snow pillow data, are the daily differences of, for 2006 at the top and 2007 at the bottom. So this is typical of the, the snowmelt environment, that we have a long season of accumulation, typically starting in October, and then a relatively shorter period of melt uh, that occurs in the spring. And again, this occurs right at the time that water resource demand has, has uh, increased. <clears throat> uh, most of you probably know what a snow pillow is, but for those who haven't, this is a, a picture of one. It's uh, a set of uh, stainless, it's a stainless steel sandwich that is filled with uh, ethylene glycol, and then one measures the pressure, and therefore measures the weight of the overlying snowpack. Uh, <clears throat> there's some pillows under development now that use load cells instead of a, a, a fluid. There's also a set of data uh, made by manual measurements that started in the Sierra Nevada in 1910 with, uh, from, with Professor James Church from the University of Nevada, Reno. And in this, you uh, plunge a tube through the snow, you pull it up, you weigh it, and from that you estimate the snow water equivalent. And there are teams of people that ski throughout the mountains uh, during the winter and make these measurements. And these jobs have very low turnover. <laughs> and, and so this is a, a slide showing the, the places in the western US where the snow courses and the snow pillows uh, exist. And note that the Sierra Nevada of California is uh, pretty densely populated with measurements. The, the named locations on the, this uh, slide are the places where we measure the snow energy balance. So with these data, uh, and because of the importance of the snowmelt runoff, the California Department of Water Resources issues a spring forecast for the April through July runoff. And this is an example of uh, two years of that forecast, uh, 2009 and 2010. Uh, 2009 being uh, about 3 quarters of the average, and 2010 being 120% of average. Uh, the units here are in cubic kilometers, uh, for those of you who like to think in acre feet, which is um, a, a cubic kilometer is about 800,000 acre feet, or roughly a million acre feet. So. Okay, so in this part of the world that is pretty well instrumented, the results are not very good. So this is the American River Basin. Uh, the horizontal axis shows the absolute uh, error in, uh, for each of the measurements. And the vertical axis 
shows the cumulative distribution frequency. So if you start, say, at 50% on the cumulative uh, distribution frequency and move horizontally, uh, that will give you the median. So the median error of uh, the forecast in a pretty well instrumented basin is 20%. And if you go up to the 80th percentile, then that error is 40%. So what that says is, you know, 20% of the time, we're making an error of 40% or more in the April through July forecast in a place that is pretty well instrumented. So why do we want to worry about this? Well, this is a, a graph from a recent uh, EOS feature article on uh, the historical temperature representation uh, going back to the year 1000, using a bunch of proxy temperature measurements uh, to take us up to the instrumental record. And what we see is that if we look at the instrumental record, that all of our statistical knowledge about how the snowpack has behaved is based on a period when temperatures were increasing. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that the statistical uh, underpinning of what we do is changing beneath us. And then if we look to the future projections, uh, it's obvious that we need a method for forecasting runoff that is based more on physical principles than on statistical relationships in the past. Uh, and even the uh, period of record has shown some interesting changes. Uh, this slide is from Danny Marks from the Reynolds Creek watershed in Idaho. And what this shows is the change in the elevation of the rain-snow transition um, over the 50-year period of record. Uh, that is, the, the upper line represents the elevation at which almost all the precipitation is snow, and the lower line represents the elevation at which most of the precipitation is rain, and the area between them is the transition zone, which we has both rain and snow during the summer. And what we see is that that elevation has risen by 400 meters over a 50-year period. And what that means for the, the area in Reynolds Creek is that in 1968, the snow-dominated zone was much bigger than it is in 2006. Now, the problem is most of the measurements are still in this zone that is snow-dominated. And so in many cases, the record that uh, occurs at the surface is not really sh yet showing uh, a lot of these sorts of trends. Um, I didn't have a picture of Danny, but he did get the SNOFU award from the Eastern Snow Conference for uh, injuring himself during field work. <laughs> okay, and this, this graph is one of mine. It takes a little bit of explaining. What I've done, take, I've taken all of the long-term snow courses in the Sierra Nevada, and I've looked at the slope of their trend over their period of record. And so, without going into too much detail, the, the red dots are those in which the snow at that particular course has uh, depleted over the years, and the blue ones are uh, those that have seen a slight increase over this period of time. And the line represents the separation as a function of latitude and elevation, where the above that line, we've seen no change or a slight increase in the amount of snow. And below that line, we've seen a decrease in the amount of snow. And note that all of the snow courses whose, uh, who, whose values have decreased over the period of record are those below that line, uh, which is a, a function of both latitude and elevation. Um, some work by Sarah Kapnick and Alex Hall is showing that the peak of snow is occurring earlier, uh, looking at the centroid of mass of the measurements over the period of record. So first of all, we're seeing a snowpack uh, that is almost the definition of the end of stationarity. And then there's the issue of, well, what are we going to do? Why, why are we doing so poorly? So there's a couple of reasons. One is that snow is terrifically heterogeneous. Uh, 
the difference between snow and rain, aside from one being liquid and the other being solid, is that once snow falls on the ground, it gets redistributed by the wind. So this is a photograph uh, at Reynolds Creek. And you can see from the fence that in the foreground, that snow is about knee deep. And, and yet, only 100 meters away, that snow is over three meters deep. And those trees have figured out where that snow is, and they go through some sort of decision support system to decide where to grow. <laughs> So in, in one sense, this, this heterogeneity is really important for providing soil moisture uh, further into the summer than it ordinarily, ordinarily would. But it also makes measurement pretty difficult. That is, if you were to locate a snow pillow in this environment, you know, where would you put it? A, a second source of heterogeneity in, is the solar radiation distribution in the mountains. So this is a graph that this portrays the ratio of the solar radiation on a slope to that on a flat surface, integrated over the day. And what we see, of course, is that during the winter when the sun is low, then there's a huge effect of slope, both positive in the case of the southerly uh, slopes and negative in the case of those uh, facing north. But as you get into the summer, that uh, difference disappears. And the reason, of course, for that, if you work out the geometry, is that during the summer, the sun goes through a much greater range of azimuths than it does during the winter. And so a north-facing slope in the summer still gets a fair amount of sun. It just gets it in the morning and the afternoon. Whereas in the winter, that's, uh, that slope may not see the sun at all. So, so what we have is a, a heterogeneous uh, deposition or a, a heterogeneous value for the amount of snow based both on variations in the accumulation and also variations uh, in the ablation. Another thing that complicates uh, forecasting is that the orographic effect varies from year to year. So the right-hand graph here shows just the values of the snow water equivalent on April 1st as a function of elevation for a particular snow pillow um, <clears throat> in two years, one 1949 and the other in uh, 1997. The, the left-hand graph is perhaps a little bit more informative in that instead of using the absolute values of the snow water equivalent, I've taken their values on the cumulative distribution uh, function. So for example, if, if it were a horizontal line at uh, at about 0.5 on the CDF, then that would be a year in which all of the snow pillows were getting about their median value for that elevation. Uh, so in this case, 1949 was getting a lot more snow than it normally gets, but at the, at the lower elevations, but at the higher elevations, it was getting a lot less snow. And 1997 was exactly the opposite. So again, this says that using a statistical relationship to forecast what's going to happen is fraught with all sorts of underlying error. So how can knowledge about the color of snow help us? So, uh, so one person whom I ran into in one of the lounges, he just looked at me when I walked by and he said, it's white. <laughs> uh, but in fact, if, if your eyes were sensitive in the near infrared part of the spectrum, snow is one of the most colorful substances in nature. And in fact, if we had that kind of vision, uh, there'd be a tourist industry in the Western United States, you know, similar to the leaf peepers in Vermont, because we'd all come out in the spring to see the colors of snow. Uh, so the, the issue is that if you, if you go out into the near infrared and the shortwave infrared part of the spectrum, beyond the visible, uh, snow gets to be much darker. And so in this example for here, you can, in fact, discriminate snow from clouds uh, because of the spectral difference. So in the left-hand image, the, the clouds and the snow are very hard to tell apart. Uh, but in the right-hand image, they're uh, pretty distinctive. So this is a graph that shows typical reflectance spectra from vegetation in the upper left, uh, soils in the lower left, uh, and snow 
in the upper right um, for various kinds of snow and various kinds of vegetation and various uh, kinds of soils. And then in the lower right is, are one of those spectra from each group overlaid on, a, uh, on the BOTUS spectral bands. And so a couple of things. One is um, compared to vegetation, for example, snow has a really big uh, range of colors. Uh, as defined as what happens uh, out beyond the, the visible. And so, uh, you know, you've seen one tree, you've seen them all, right? They're, uh, <laughs> compared to snow, vegetation all kind of looks the same. And similarly, <laughs> and similarly, all rocks kind of look the same <laughs> uh, to, to first order, right? Uh, but what is really distinctive about snow in this in this spectral characterization is that it's one of the few substances in nature that is bright in the visible part of the spectrum and quite dark in the shortwave infrared part of the spectrum. And what this has led to is a way of mapping snow. Uh, and in fact, one of the standard products from MODIS is a map of snow at 500 meter resolution uh, available daily. Okay, so what's going on that causes this uh, big change in the reflectance of snow? What, what is the property? So new fallen snow in an electron microscope uh, looks like this. Uh, you know, when you were children in elementary school, you folded up a piece of paper and you cut it out and you unfolded it and you had a snowflake and that's what they looked like, right? That, that was a pretty good uh, simulation. Uh, but once snow falls, it goes through a lot of processes in the pack. Uh, water vapor moves around with temperature gradients and where the grains touch each other there's surface diffusion and grain boundary diffusion and, and so when you look at snow in a, in a snow pack those crystals are not very similar to what fell out of the sky. Uh, and so what happens now is that light uh, penetrates the snow pack and it, uh, it hits a, a snow particle and it either reflects off of it or it goes through it. Most of it, most of the light goes through it. So this is a graph that shows on the right hand axis the absorption coefficient of ice which over the wavelengths of the solar spectrum varies by uh, eight orders of magnitude. Uh, and in the visible part of the spectrum ice is very transparent. And so, you know, just as you're, when you're diving in uh, clear water, you can see a long way. Uh, if you were frozen in bubble-free ice, uh, you'd be able to see a long way. Uh, not that it would do you much good. Uh, but in the, as we move beyond the visible into the near-infrared part of the spectrum, ice becomes much more absorptive. And in the wavelengths where ice is moderately absorptive, the reflectance is sensitive to the grain size. And the reason is where it's moderately absorptive, it's sensitive to the path, the length of the path that the light takes as it's going through the grain. So the other thing we note from this slide is uh, around 1.03 micrometers, there's a little dip in the absorption uh, coefficient of ice and my distinguished colleague sitting on the stage with me <laughs> has uh, <laughs> proposed a method of uh, estimating the grain size by looking at the area under that absorption feature. But the basic idea is that we can get at the grain size and therefore we can get at the albedo by uh, looking at the shape of the spectrum uh, rather than its absolute magnitude. And the advantage of this is that therefore we're not as sensitive to the slope of the surface and the difficulty in registering a satellite image uh, to the topography. Because of these, um, this, these characteristic spectral reflectance, when the snow is clean, even though most of the radiation that's coming in is in the visible part of the spectrum, the net radiation is greatest in the near infrared part of the spectrum. 
So in this graph, the, the blue line on top shows a typical uh, spectral curve of the incoming solar radiation at the surface in a reasonably clear atmosphere. The stuff below the line is showing uh, the spectrum of the reflected radiation. Uh, and then the, the one below the blue line is, shows the net radiation absorbed by the snowpack. And it's much greater in the visible part of this, in the near infrared part of the spectrum than it is in the visible. So the thing to remember when you, uh, when you look at snow is to remember that about half of the incoming solar radiation is beyond the visible spectrum. And so what is happening to the surface out in those wavelengths is pretty important. Um, now there is something that affects the reflectance in the visible part of the spectrum, and that is the presence of absorbing impurities, like dust, uh, soot. Uh, to some extent, these uh, red algae that live in the snow, although they typically don't uh, cover a big area. Uh, the nice thing about the algae is that uh, you know, in the biological sciences, if there's an interesting critter that we know about, there's somebody has spent a lifetime uh, studying that critter, and that's uh, certainly the case with the red algae. But what you see in the lower left-hand uh, part of this slide is a photograph with extensive uh, dust cover in the San Juans. So, and so because these impurities uh, reduce the reflectance in the visible part of the spectrum, where, again, about half of the incoming radiation is. This is a separate effect from the reduction in the reflectance that's caused by grain growth. So on the left-hand slide is, uh, is a picture showing uh, the spectral reflectance of dirty snow. And on the right-hand slide is a, uh, the same kind of uh, graph showing the reflectance from snow with the red algae in it. Uh, and, you know, they're pretty similar except for the chlorophyll absorption features that you see in the uh, algae graph. Um, and that's because in the San Juans, <clears throat> most of the dust has come from a red state. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we see the same thing. This is uh, the solar radiation at our instrument site on Mammoth Mountain. Uh, through the season, you'll see on the left-hand slide, the incoming solar radiation, of course, rises uh, as we go from the spring into the summer because the sun is higher. Uh, and below that, you see the measured reflectance radiation. And if you look at the, up, uh, the upper right graph, what you see is that during the winter, there's a a decline in the reflectance of snow with the occasional spikes that are caused by new snowfall. Uh, but that decline, that gradual decline, is in fact caused by grain growth. And then toward the end of the season, we get a, a more radical decline that's caused by uh, contaminants on the snow from, uh, you know, as the area around it becomes patchy. Uh, and therefore, if you look at the net radiation, which is the lower right-hand graph, you see that it gets, it steepens much more than the incoming radiation does. So two things are happening then to the snowpack as we go into the spring. One is that we're getting more solar radiation because of the changes in sun angle and day length, but we're also getting a somewhat darker snow cover during that time. Okay, in the uh, Colorado River, this forcing of dust has been around for a long time. Uh, that is, uh, in sediments uh, core show that in pre-industrial times, the dust accumulation was pretty low, uh, but with grazing, uh, it, it rose quite a bit. And then it actually decreased a little bit starting uh, in 1880 when, the, uh, when we reduced the uh, amount of grazing that occurred. But the historical record then on the Colorado has, uh, has really been a time when the snow has been pretty dusty. And the consequence of that is that the dust is in fact causing that snow to melt earlier than a clean snowpack would. And in this particular situation, it's actually uh, causing a little bit less runoff. 
And 5% isn't very much, but as uh, Painter and his colleagues have pointed out, this is twice the allocation of uh, Las Vegas. It's a year and a half of uh, El Los Angeles's use, and it's half of what is allocated to Mexico uh, from the Colorado flow. So what can we do to, uh, to help get at this problem of more accurately assessing the amount of snow in the mountains? Well, in particular, I'm interested in what we can do with existing satellites. There's a lot of discussion about what might come in the future, but, you know, I'm getting old. And uh, <clears throat> as one of my friends says, I, I hesitate to buy green bananas anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we can do with the MODIS instrument is we can not only sense whether there's snow on it, uh, on the ground or not, but for each 500 meter pixel, we can estimate the fraction of snow that uh, covers that pixel. And that's what the image on the right shows. Um, because MODIS gives us daily data, uh, we can also in, interpolate over periods of cloud cover. So, and, and it also helps us identify the cloud cover. So what we see in the, uh, in the upper left diagram is the fractional snow cover that we would measure with this, this algorithm. And what we see in the lower left is the MODIS cloud mask. And there's an area, a big area that the cloud detection algorithm has indicated is cloud rather than snow. But the fact that we can also estimate the grain size means that we can tell snow from clouds. I mean, the difference between snow and a cloud is snow is where the cloud particles have gotten big enough that they fell down to the ground, right? And so what we're able to do then is, um, is come up with a corrected cloud mask uh, based on our, S our measurement of the snow, and therefore, uh, which that's what's shown in the lower right-hand corner. And then, because we have daily, daily data, what we can think of is those daily images form a data cube, which is shown in the upper left. And then we can do a time-space interpolation to get at our best estimate of what's going on on the ground every day. OK, and then if we can uh, try to drive, use these data to drive an energy balance model. And so this is uh, work based on what Carl Ritker has done to take uh, data from NLDAS, the uh, data national uh, land data simulation system. And what's shown on the upper left is the uh, global solar radiation at the surface from the NLDAS uh, assimilation. What's shown on the upper right is uh, uh, spatially averaging or integrating those data at a 100 meter grid cell resolution instead of an eighth of a degree resolution. And then on the lower left, we then correct those data for elevation, uh, assuming that the optical depth scales with the air pressure. And then in the lower right, we add the topographic correction for slope. And so we start out with a, an available product, which is shown in the upper left, uh, that is available hourly, and we produce a solar radiation at the surface uh, on the lower right. So what we can do then is we can use these data to drive what is called a, a snow cover depletion model or a reconstruction. That is, we can tell from the remote sensing when the snow disappears from a pixel. And what we can do then is back calculate and figure out how much snow there was at a particular date in the past. And this is just a, uh, uh, a reconstruction over uh, a particular snow pillow. And so uh, back in 1981, uh, Martinek and Rango uh, figured out that you could do this with remote sensing. And this is a reconstruction that Noah Malich has done uh, for the Sierra Nevada. So what we see on the top are the uh, snow cover at various uh, times over a, a three-week period. And then at the bottom, we see a reconstruction of the amount of snow uh, for part of that period. 
So if we look at that reconstruction in more detail, we, we see some interesting things that are important for uh, forecasting water. We see at the higher elevations, there's a fair amount of snow. And much of that snow is above the highest measurement station. So one of the problems that we face in, in managing this water resource is that when all the snow disappears from all the snow pillows, uh, no matter how good you are at GIS uh, manipulation, it's pretty hard to run any sort of a, an, an interpolation that will take a bunch of zeros and produce some other value uh, uh, somewhere else. And, and this turns out to be important for management of the water. Uh, Bruce McGurk, the manager of the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, tells me that he could use water to generate electricity and make about $100,000 a day, uh, not for himself by doing that. Uh, <clears throat> but he, he doesn't know how much snow is still left in the watershed. So he doesn't know whether he needs to hang on to water so that when you come to AGU, you can take a shower. Uh, or could he uh, use some of that water to generate electricity? So this is, it's where the standard uh, operational measurements uh, don't give us the answer. And so what we can do is, uh, is start to learn about the, uh, what the historical record has told us in terms of uh, the way that the snow has been distributed in the Sierra. Uh, one advantage of the 10-year period of MODIS is that we've seen a lot of variability. And so we've now experienced uh, these kinds of data under a wide variety of settings. So there are some difficulties about that I think are challenges uh, for the future and for you. So this energy balance reconstruction, um, you know, seems to be pretty accurate, at least where we've got the measurements to validate it. The problem is for uh, management of water resources is it comes after the fact. That is, we know how much snow is there in the, we know how much snow was there when we measure when it goes away in the summer. What is in the right-hand diagram is an interpolation of the snow cover based on the measurements at the snow pillows, but constrained by the satellite telling us where that measurement has to go to zero. That is, we measure the boundary of it. If we don't do that, if you just take the snow pillow ballot values and you plug them into your favorite spatial interpolation routine, you, you'll spread snow out into the ocean, right? Because they don't tell you, those pillows don't tell you where it goes to zero. The problem is those two, we, we'd like to make the right-hand graph look more like the left-hand image because then we could use it in a forecasting scheme. So I think one of the challenges, and certainly any of you are willing to, or are, are perfectly free to take that idea and run with it, is how do we use what we know about the reconstruction to improve the, the real-time interpolation? And that's kind of an example of what Jim Gray said in the fourth paradigm, that this really is a data mining problem. The other is this issue of heterogeneity that uh, Anlin Call gave uh, a nice presentation earlier, or on Monday, uh, just yesterday, that if you, if you, if the snow, if this pixel, for example, is 100% covered with snow, and what we can do is run a snowmelt model on that pixel, and as the snow depletes, we can tell what fraction of the pixel corresponded to that depth of snow. And so what we end up with is a reconstruction of the heterogeneity within each grid cell. And so this then allows us to, um, to estimate how much of that grid cell will in fact have snow that persists further into the summer. Another um, challenge for the future is that there is there's variability in topography within the satellite grid cell. And so uh, when we apply these reconstruction methods, we apply a uniform melt rate to the grid cell 
and we have to figure out uh, a better way to handle that problem. Finally, one of the things, and I haven't uh, focused very much on the difficulty of everything that came to this point, but handling these satellite data and producing these kinds of estimates uh, is a computationally intensive and it requires a lot of arcane knowledge about the optical properties of snow and about how the satellite works and all that kind of stuff. And what we really need to be able to do is have a better way of sharing what we've done with each other. So if we look at data that are available, if we look at the low level data, the snow course measurements, the temperature measurements, uh, most agencies do that pretty well. Uh, that is, those, those data are generally discoverable. You can usually go to some website, download them, and do whatever you want. It's when we get to the higher order syntheses of these data that they become less available. So, for example, it's really easy to go to the California Department of Water Resources website and download all the data for a single station. It is much harder to get the data for a particular year from all the stations so that you can, uh, you can look at the data in a different way. And so at the same time that as these data move up this, uh, this value ladder, they become more valuable because more people can use them, but they become less available. Right? So, so one of the things we think about is we handle publications pretty well. We can write, we can read, we can find things. And the same thing should be true for data. Uh, that is, if we divide the, the sort of data consumers among users, among agencies, and among people who produce data, um, you know, as a user, you want to be able to, to find the data. If you're running an agency, uh, you, you want to have data available in a way that improves your decisions. And as a data author, that is someone who produces it, I, I would like to help you. Uh, and I'd also like to get credit for it. I'd like to you know, have a citation index that glows in the dark. Uh, <laughs> so we, we think, therefore, of what I call this data cycle, that Normally, we start out with this idea that we acquire data and then we do things with them. That is, we collaborate with each other, we mine the data, we analyze them, and we disseminate and share. But what we don't do a very good job is closing that cycle so that whatever one of us produces is used to further analysis by someone else. That is, the output of what I do with data should be the input of what some of you want to do with data. And that brings us back to the fourth paradigm. Because what that says, if we're going to be able to do data intensive scientific discovery, then we have to have a way that data themselves are discoverable and searchable and downloadable in a fairly easy fashion. So we've come to the end. Uh, as James Joyce said, Finnis, the author of all books. Uh, and don't think I'm too literary. I, I plowed through Finnegan's Wake, and that's about what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to thank people. Uh, so I, this is my 37th year at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, more than half my life, and it's been a really good place to think about snow and ice. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, various agencies, NASA, NSF, NGA, NOAA, uh, U.S. Army Krell, and the California Department of Water Resources have helped. And then there aren't many talks that acknowledge Mammoth Mountain Ski Area, Black Diamond uh, Equipment, and Microsoft as for the help that they've given me. Um, I'm, I'm posting these slides on slideshare.net, so if you, uh, you know, 
want to see the presentation again, you can do that. Uh, but what it also has is there'll be a references page for all the citations that appeared on the slides during the talk. Um, I thought about talking, thanking my colleagues, and then I realized I just had too many. Um, when I fill out one of those um, two-page NSF CVs where you have to list your conflicts of interest, that, that actually becomes the largest part of my CV. But I do have to thank my students because uh, they've inspired me, uh, they've taught me a lot, uh, and uh, they're all out there doing good work and I'm hanging onto their coattails very tightly. So uh, thank you all and uh, we're good. <laughs>
have estimate precipitation gradients much better than the final distribution gradients. Okay, so the so the point that Mishi made is that that using a a precipitation model, that is say a numerical weather prediction model to get at precipitation would be an approach to the problem. I, in principle, I agree. I, I don't think that those are very well validated. That is when we see the, you know, at least in this era, when we see the results from the quantitative precipitation forecasts, uh, first of all, the models all differ from one another. and. Secondly, to me at least, they seem to be verified mostly by anecdotal observation. Steve. Uh, so to follow up on uh, the question, uh, you said that uh, the snowpack is indicative of non-stationarity. Uh, and we want to look at scales. Uh, any thoughts on scales of monitoring and some ideas of where you suggest we should monitor? Well, I, I think the, the, those questions go well together because typically a, a uh, numerical weather model, you know, has a grid cell of, of say, 10 kilometers or something like that. And, and one of the questions is, well, where do you measure in that 10 kilometer box in order to figure out how well the model is doing? And so I think, therefore, you, you need to go to the remote sensing approach where you're, in fact, estimating what's going on in every 10 kilometer box. And then you can see whether the model is in fact producing what you want. Yeah. How well do you understand the, the status of the salt water storage prior to the initiation of the snow belt? Okay, so the question is how well do we understand the soil water storage? I, I don't think, one of the things we typically don't do with the current operational network is that we don't actually do a water balance. So because there is no effort in order to actually estimate the volume of water that is stored in the snowpack. So uh, for example, in, in California, 1976 and 1977 were very dry. And uh, 1978 was a pretty wet year. And the forecasts were off by 30% in that particular year, um, all over the Sierra. Uh, that is, uh, the forecasts were, were too high. And we actually don't know what the source of the error was. You know, did we simply, uh, was that a year in which we particularly badly estimated the amount of snow? Or was there much more storage than we normally think there is in these pretty shallow soils? And the, the problem is we, we don't, I mean, I can make guesses about what that answer is, but without actually getting at the volume of water that is stored in the snowpack, we, we can't do a water balance, which is what you're suggesting. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. First of all, congratulations. And, uh, hey, Michael, how are you? <laughs> uh, two questions. One, um, you know, you did talk at the beginning about the fact that one of the reasons we are so damn wrong is because the change in these things with Wharton. So you know you sort of didn't mention there's a famous phrase about the end of stationarity. But in fact you show that you can estimate the parameters pretty well. So you never came back to say, you know, if you include those changes in time in some of the model parameters, why you can't fix the problem. And the other one is a totally different question. You know, you're in a little bit of a large scale for this question, maybe 500 meters. But what about using the satellite data for avalanche prediction? <laughs> okay, so um, there were lots of questions wrapped up in those remarks. Uh, but why we, uh, so what we're trying to do with avalanche prediction, and I actually have a PhD student who is the avalanche forecaster at Mammoth Mountain now. And, um, and what we're trying to do is a couple of things. One is to figure out uh, where the loading is occurring during uh, storms using a wind transport model. But there's another thing that's very puzzling about avalanches in the maritime climate. 
that we're, we're trying to work on. And that is in, in the classic Rocky Mountain avalanche uh, situation and you know, what we all read in avalanche books is that avalanches occur at interfaces between layers. That new snow or you have some layer under the snowpack that breaks away. And what we're seeing in the observations we've made is that for storms, the avalanche is occurring in the storm layer. And that is puzzling us a lot. So it's, so in the one sense, getting at where the loading is occurring is really important. But there's something fundamental about the mechanics of the actual release that is, we, I don't think we yet know. And I, I don't think I can, I, that I have to dig snow pits and I do remote sensing at the very narrow scale of, you know, just being a little ways away from the, uh, from the snow pit wall. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. And, uh,